Hi, uh, good morning everyone. Uh, we are at the final class of pastoral research or academy research within the a, a, a pastoral context. So basically we've discussed uh, the, the understanding of academy research and how that research should apply or imply to a uh, Christian context for the students and for the uh, ministers as well. And uh, we came to the topic of research ethics. And uh, the research ethics. Uh, to discuss this research ethics as we understand in America or in a Western world, uh, it is probably important uh, for us, uh, some of the Asian uh, students uh, who are either grew up in uh, China, Korea, and uh, Japan, or some other uh, Eastern, uh, the, the, the Southwestern, Southeastern, uh, sorry, Southeastern Asia. Uh, in our, in Eastern world, uh, the research and then uh, the ethics regarding the academic uh, work is somewhat, somewhat different from that of uh, the Western world. So as we study in America, uh, trying to, you know, uh, there's a famous saying, when you're in Rome, you follow the uh, laws of the Rome. The same thing applies for us, uh, especially those who grew up in an Asian context. It is important to understand uh, the, the standard and the, and the rules and instructions regarding research ethics. And the things that we, the Asians, many Asians consider okay and uh, as normal and traditional and acceptable may not, may not be acceptable or even uh, you can be penalized uh, for doing the same thing that you've done in your country and would have not be in trouble but so that's that's how it is. So it is to, important to understand there is certain different standards uh, between Western world and then us in an Asian context. So knowing that, uh, understanding this research ethics is important for us who are pursuing and uh, studying in academic context in America. So we'll discuss this. Excuse me. Okay. So ethical uh, research. We want to do ethical research not unethical research or even illegal uh, research. When we talk about ethical, it should be legal and it should be acceptable within the, the social norm. And then uh, we have something called conscience. So whether you're a Westerner or Easterner or Asian, that there is uh, some common uh, sense uh, and a common conscience that we need to follow. And there's something beyond or add additional to a common sense. And uh, we should pursue ethical research. Uh, research ethics and the common sense and Christian ethics. These are some of uh, the key standards uh, that we need to uh, Consider when we do when we are doing a, a research.
So what is a research ethics? Uh, research ethics, there's a, you know, the, just common sense. You do not steal someone else's uh, research process and result without giving the credit. I mean, that's, that's very basic. And you want to be creative when you're doing the, uh, you know, master and beyond the level. And most ethical standard, you do not lie, you do not steal. These things uh, are, you know, key to doing the documentation, but beyond the documentation, even prior to documentation, research ethics should apply. Does this research, particular research, benefit in a positive way? Does it, does this research benefit all humankind? If it is if you're doing cert, uh, certain research for the the goods of certain minority people who already have power and privilege or you're if you're doing it for your own sake and then we might have some question regarding that kind of research so first thing to ask do i do this research first the good of others, good of many? And if the answer is yes, and are you doing this just research just for the, your own uh, monetary gain, meaning to earn money? If that, that would be the only reason for your research, then you have some issues with your uh, research ethics. Uh, for example, I mean, the, the medication, uh, we need the coronavirus vaccine, vaccine and also we need the coronavirus uh, cure. So many drug, drug companies, they are doing research, but if their reason is just to gain the profit, to make out the profit, then uh, you will have issues. But basically, whether they, it is true or not, I mean, that's, uh, you know, you cannot tell, but they say the many, most of uh, companies, drug companies say, we are doing this for the good of human generation. They should be the, uh, primary underlying uh, reason for their research for the medications for coronavirus. So those are some of the examples. So you gotta ask if this is for the good, common goods, good of others. So that's common sense, general rule of thumb. And then there's uh, the so-called Christian ethics. Many times, this Christian ethics will overlap, overlap with the general uh, common sense. But there are some of the things, for example, research regarding uh, the, the, the abortion, for example, that would be either it could be ethically appropriate in a, in a biblical sense or it may not even though you're doing the same uh, research on the topic or subject of abortion and if you're writing a, 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 a document uh, or dissertation or thesis on the, some of those these subjects sensitive subjects then we need to follow the biblical uh, standard if you go beyond i mean beyond the christian perspective or christian worldview or christian teachings then we will have some issues
So having to have a, a very clear ethical standard as a Christian is the bottom line uh, for uh, the, the considering whether your research is ethical or not. So in from Christian standard, the Western world basically they grew out of uh, this Christian uh, teachings and culture. So what they are saying is, if you quote, I mean, if you take someone else's word and the ideas even, if, if you are not taking the exact uh, the, uh, wording, still, if you're taking that idea and if it's not your original and you, you have uh, copied or read something from someone else's book and the, someone else's research and if you're taking that idea into your research then you need to verify that meaning you need to make a statement that the idea is borrowed from such and such that's giving the credential it doesn't have to be, many times it doesn't have to be the formal citation or uh, the, the, the quotation uh, giving the footnote, but at uh, least you should uh, name the, uh, the author or the researchers who has given that idea to you or the books that you have read where you got the idea so that's how we approach in the Western world. Uh, it's, you have to give a credit to that person. That's the least that you're uh, to do as a, an ethical academic researcher. So those are the baselines. So we'll go into the making quotes. When you're writing a thesis or dissertation, or even a term paper, uh, it is critical and very important in the Western society, in the Western academic world, to make a proper quotation, giving the credit. First, previous words. When you're doing a research, any academic research, especially in a, a in a Christian context or pastoral context, you, I mean, you have reached your level of knowledge and your level of academic uh, achievement without without someone else's achievement prior to you, so who you are as a student and who you are as a pastor and a teacher, you have to give credit to all other information that is out there that you have read and studied and taught. And when you're doing a certain uh, research on a, on, on a particular subject, there are always someone who has done previous work or works. You cannot start from a scratch. I mean, it, it is rarely a case. I, I would say 99.9% .9 of the, uh, the topics that you choose to study will be nothing new someone has already done some study on it, has done, written some articles, some papers, some documentations on it. So you will start from there. So those previous works by other researchers are key to uh, your, your study. It's, it's important for you. And when that happens, when that happens, and especially when it is in writing, writing, and if you have read that writing, 
And if you want to bring that uh, statement either to, to bring the idea or to support your, your uh, claim, whatever the case, the quotation is the basic necessity. You have to make a quotation and you give to, have to give the reference and the citation of that reference. Quotation is good for you. Quotation is good for you because those authorities and, and their expertise will make your work credible. Credible. So these are some of the key elements for the academic uh, work. And uh, your work needs to be validated. Validity is one of the key issues regarding any academic research. And then we have something called reliability. Can, can you trust this? No for the time being and then to the to the future. I mean validity and reliability are given by authentication. How do you authenticate your work? It is by giving the reference to the someone who knows better than you. There's always someone who is better than you. I mean you never assume you would be the best. I mean, that's, that's very, very false assumption. Out there, so many who are diligent, who are better, who are smarter than you. You may be an expert on certain small area, but that does not mean that you're always better than others. So it is always good to quote who has been already proven and validated and trusted. That if you bring those quotations, you know, in in some some for some reason in an Asian culture, especially uh, those who are who has been influenced by the Confucian or Confucius ideals. Uh, borrowing someone else's idea is considered considered less. I mean, I cannot put the, the exact uh, English word for it, but it's not a shame, but people are reluctant some for some reason. And especially those in a in the face of value society you no know, we we kind of we are reluctant to acknowledge someone else's achievement that that's somehow is uh, it's underlying in the in the culture itself so either whether it's you no know, shame or for some other reason that there's a that reluctance and there's a, a the, uh, certain uh, sense of normalcy regarding taking someone else's idea and just you can say it as if it's yours and for some reason that has been acceptable in many of the Asian cultures. 
it, it was not required or some for some reason it people avoided and uh, so that's that's why there is a, some sense that you don't need really necessary to verify or identify where that uh, the information came from it was not mandated it's not required in asian culture many of, and not all of them but many of the asian cultures so this idea quotation is good for you this might uh, sound kind of uh, unlikely or strange to you but this is what it is it is true it's especially when you're doing a study and academic uh, you know work in uh, in western contexts such as america and you got to remember the quotation is good for you it is it's like a you know you can boast about it i quoted this and this person and uh, he or she is very famous and he or she is authority in this field and then you can you can be proud of having to quote uh, that person and uh, there's a question of what to quote and how to quote when you're doing quotation you need to do this quotation mark on the very exact quotation or if you're doing it without quotation mark you may paraphrase that you may just bring the idea still you need to make that notation or the, the, the statement this has been brought from someone else's idea so whether it's the idea or exact statement you, you're quoting you're bringing that into your work that means it's not originally yours as long as it's not originally yours you need to make that necessary quotation unless unless it's like a commonly known idea or sayings then probably you, you don't usually you don't need to make that kind of quotation giving credits we talked about this so far methods there are several ways and means to do the quotation uh, I mean uh, there, there's several things that regarding the uh, the ethics uh, of the, the academic ethics or research ethics so these are some of the examples I'll try to explain subject matter ethics some of the subject matters you you do not want to give your time and energy precious time and energy for certain subjects that are unethical uh, some of the christians have tried to study a Satan for example and uh, many of them end up being you know Saturn Saturnized because the Satan I mean there is a just so so little uh, about uh, written about Satan even in the Bible so if you go beyond the Bible you know you're you're stepping into the 
the mind feel when you're studying like a Satan or evil angels and the, those those are some of the subjects that you may want to avoid then methodology how you do the study if you have to like bribe someone to do your research or if you have to do some other unethical things to achieve the result of your study then it may con be considered unethical For example, uh, some some of the animal rights activists, uh, animal rights activists, activists are against the research using the animals as you know the the the. the guinea pigs, for example, or rats. Eventually, I mean, these research end up killing monkeys, dogs, and uh, uh, the, the mouse, and the guinea pigs, and minks, and so on. I mean, the list is very long. And they, they think it's unethical. So methodology, how you do it might be an issue but many times in the, you know this pure library research these methodology are not involved as long as you make a proper quotation and follow those guidelines for doing the cite, citation and referencing and so on so those would be the main issue. Misleading conclusion. That is common for the pastoral and Christian researches, especially when you are doing the library research. Library research, you know, you you may already have your own conclusion and try to support that conclusion using the only the data that is supportive to to your your idea and thesis without without making the proper critic of the opposition or opposite ideas this this is called the balance of your research even if you already have your presumption and assumption and conclusion to uh, the certain issue, you need to give a proper criticism and evaluation to the oppo opposing ideas or opinions to balance your, your research. If that hasn't been done, and if you're only discussing within your your idea without considering some other objective or uh, 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 opposing ideas then you're losing that balance and that means your research is not so credible because you're just running within your own field, with your own boundary. So that's easily go to misleading conclusion. And uh, one of the most popular 
ways to the misleading conclusion is manipulating the data. Because many researches, whether it's field research or whether it's a library research, whatever the research that you're doing, you can mislead the conclusion by manipulating your data. And when that happens, it's truly and obviously unethical. And many researchers, many researchers are tempted, tempted to do that. Even within those natural science field, this, these are the issues, misleading conclusion by manipulating the data. Because today's research, especially the social research, when it becomes a uh, not quantitative but qualitative study, even with a quantitative study, uh, the data is the raw data is, is the key to the to bring the conclusion. Because we call that scientific when the data is supported, and the, when the data is vast. And when data is reliable, so misleading conclusion by manipulating data would be one of the good examples of unethical method of, uh, of, of research. Also intended false statements. When you're trying to come up with a, a misleading conclusion, not by mistake, but if it's intended, that's worse. That's worse. You can make a mistake. You can misinterpret the uh, data. That does happen for researchers. And then when you have a uh, limited data, you may uh, reach, uh, you know, misinterpretation. That's not still okay, but you know, that's acceptable because you did not intend to do it. But sometimes the researchers have the intention because they are paid many times, supported by someone who has a certain intense interest on the outcome of that uh, research and study that will bring the profits or they may gain they may have political gain or some other gains by quoting or using that research and then when when that's the case they are willing to pay for it and when that happens researchers may lose their ethical position and make those false statements or misleading statements or misinterpreted statements by intention that's that's key when it is intentional that's that's obviously you know an issue and you're you're committing a crime Crime. It's not just a mistake, it's a, it becomes a crime. So another way of misleading or being unethical is a mispresentation. For example, you found You have found five findings, one through five. A misrepresentation is such as being one through five. Let's say number five is the most
most critical of the research to come up with a conclusion. And that means you should focus your dis uh, the discussion on number five rather than one through four. Misrepresentation of research, whether you're documenting it or writing a thesis or dissertation or making the uh, presentation, whatever the case, if you focus one through four instead of five, which is a, the key, then you're misrepresenting. Or rather you, you focus on number one, which is the least important, and then make it the, the most important for most of your presentation, then you're doing misrepresentation. Whether it's intentional, whether it's a mistake, so the result is misrepresentation. So the, you need to have those balance. When it is important, you're gonna give more time, more, more space, and more documentation to it, emphasize it. And if it's less important, you're gonna give less of the uh, portion. Same thing with the you know, lectures that I give, you know, when it is more important, so even though that it's only one, uh, one uh, slide, I can go on for 20, 30 minutes because I like to give that, that emphasis to that uh, particular topic. So that's the example of misrepresentation there. Good. Okay, why don't I stop here for a break and I'll come back, okay? Okay. Let us continue uh, with the topic. Yeah, we we have discussed how the, there's a uh, ethics regarding the method, the presentation, and the process of research, and even the topics of research may be considered sometimes unethical. So we need to be careful. This pleasure. Pleasure is taking someone else's research or idea, the words and the phrase, and putting into your research, especially when you are doing the writings, documentation, the dissertation or thesis or term paper. When you're doing it, if you're bringing that idea and the sentence and, and the concepts even without, without making the reference, proper reference to the particular person or the books or the source, then you are doing perjury. And uh, why, why does it matter? Because first, it has to do with the academic integrity, being truthful. And you know, integrity is the key concept that sustains or is fundamental to especially American culture and American society. If you have to choose some of the fundamental ideas uh, for America is freedom and then the right and the, 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 the justice. 
and then these things can be worded in I mean uh, related to integrity integrity is very basic to American culture lying is very serious serious uh, ethical issue to Americans uh, as you know I, I could say in, in us many of our Asian cultures that the, the we we are not so so much compared to America I mean we are less sensitive about lying and stealing not because it we don't think it's it's a, a crime and it's, it's, it's a, a, a bad thing but historically culturally some of the lie some of the stealing was justified and acceptable because many of the leaders leaders especially those top leaders they do steal and they do lie and they do get away with it and some are even respected in spite of doing the lying and the stealing because of those the cultural acceptance uh, you know same thing uh, the, in in the, in an academic field still there is a, that kind of normalcy and then acceptance about lying and stealing but in America that has to do with your, your integrity and if your integrity fails and you are not considered worth of doing business or doing some other things so it's basically it's a theft you're stealing perjury is a theft so how to avoid it make an exact I mean proper quotation and the citation and give the reference and give the credit and you can avoid this uh, the, the trap of uh, perjury so that kind of concludes Now, since we have discussed uh, uh, the ethics, now we'll go into, uh, with the, the time left, uh, this is part three, design of pastoral research. If, if, I mean, I don't think I will be able to finish the whole thing uh, in the given time. So um, whatever is left, uh, just look into your textbook and then, you know, you can probably uh, get some help from the textbook anyway the design of pastoral research and as, as a teacher pastor and as even a Christian students who are uh, studying in institutions like this uh, you, you need to design a your research whether you are writing a term paper or doing the thesis dissertation these are necessary so how to initiate a research? First, elaborate on your background. Because your background, who you are, is key to what you are going to do the study on. Your research, your, your, I mean, who you are is going to determine what you are going to research. First, there are these, some of these things you need to consider. These are 
should be put into consideration. Expertise. What do you know the best and the most? Most and the best. The quantity and the quality of your knowledge or the, the field that you are going to cover and the tackle is important because you know you when you're like a, to the high up to high school your knowledge base is broadening broadening your knowledge you're trying to uh, you know tackle or 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 the encounter as many subjects as possible and get the basic knowledge on these various fields, whether it's mathematics, chemistry, or physics, language, sociology. You know, we study uh, music and then arts. You, you study these things from elementary to high school. And as you, as you go up from elementary, junior high, high school, you kind of narrow down uh, and then, then deepens your knowledge to a particular area of interest. What you like and what you're good at. These are two other parameters or the standards on you know growing your academic ability. So you want to do what you like and you want to be good at it. But you know if you have to choose I would rather give priority to what you like. If it is something that you like, it is more likely that you are going to develop your skills. Even though it may be slower than others, but you're going to continue to do get some interest and do put efforts into it because you like it. So if you don't like it, and even if you're good at it, I doubt that you're going to be successful on anything. So most and the best, and the you like it and you're good at it. That those that these are the the kind of standard uh, for determining your expertise. So as you continue to study. Your knowledge is going, I mean, the field is going to be narrowed down and deepened while the elementary to high school you're broadening your base of knowledge. Now, once you determine which fields that you are going to be interested and in, uh, uh, that you, you want to continue to be interested, then you are deepening the knowledge. So that's expertise. But not everyone is given the opportunity to be able to encounter and do the, uh, the, the deafening or the intensifying of the knowledge, which comes to the next subject of training. We need to be trained, trained to be an expert on certain subject. So can the, the education is one of the, uh, I mean the classroom education, such as uh, this kind of institution, that's part of training. 
And there is something called field training or on hand training, actually doing. For the pastors, pastoral, I mean, since we are doing the pastoral research, for the pastors, teachers, Christian teachers, you need to go out and practice what you have learned, the knowledge from the classroom, you need to be tested and, and out there in the field, in the classroom, in the, in the church, and so on. And that's also part of the training. So if you have a proper training that you are prepared and ready for the, for the academic uh, research, or pastoral research, whatever you like. Then interest, I already talked about it. And then academic works. Have you done any academic works on a given topic and the subject? For example, the, I, I've studied the leadership, right? And the leadership is one of the the key interest area because not only I have been put onto the position of leadership myself for many years but I like to raise other leaders so they can lead some other people and I've done some academic works on the the topic of leadership. I've done PhD level studies, so that kind of qualifies me to study on the topic of leadership. So these, these you know, are some of the key elements that you need to consider when you're choosing a certain uh, research topics and preparing to do the research on. Intrigue. Uh, intrigue is something that you are going to be having the interest on. And when you have many questions, unanswered questions, usually your intrigue is there. Your intrigue is there. You're, you're trying to pursue the, the, that particular topic and subject because you have unanswered questions. So those is that, that, that is called intrigue. And intrigue is one of the key elements for a researcher. I mean, that, that gives you initiative, meaning you want to you know, begin that research because you are so interested, you have that intrigue into that particular subject. Then once you have elaborated on your background and yourself if you are ready and proper for a certain uh, topic of the research that you are going to do then these are the next consideration now you have to rationalize your research meaning this is why i need to study this particular subject and the answer is, you're gonna do, you have to find the reason. Why, why am I doing this? What for? Is it for, you know, to, to satisfy your intrigue? That's fine, that's good, it's good reason. And to build your career, that's another good reason. I mean, as a pastor, you need to continue to study and upgrade your knowledge and then the level of knowledge if you're to continue your career as a pastor. That's one of the good, good reasons, I, I should say. 
uh, to boast about your knowledge, I don't think it's a good reason uh, to boast about your levels of knowledge. I mean, that's, there might be a hidden uh, agenda, uh, but you know, I don't think it's a good reason. So you need to find a good reason or reasons, reason or reasons for your uh, expectations. What do I expect? The, the outcome. What is the outcome of this uh, this study that I expect? So you need to have a, the, the the proper expectation and the valid and value expectation for your study. Because when you you know do something, anything. I mean, <laughs> any project or any plan, you do have certain goals and objectives. Uh, those are included in the expectations. Then contribution to the field. Am I going to contribute? You don't, I mean, it doesn't have to be very important. Uh, usually it's just uh, not that very important, but it is important. And it's going to be that little contribution to the given field. Usually, I mean, you don't make that, you know, milestone and game changing contribution to the field. Usually, you don't. Especially in this pastoral, uh, the Christian pastoral uh, context, uh, you know, it's been studied like 2,000 years so far already and the many previous researchers and good scholars have done much of this study important studies so whatever you do it's already someone has done it or you can improve it just a little add something little more to the that uh, knowledge the, the the base of knowledge that still is contribution. So, am I contributing to the, 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 the this field of the knowledge? That would be the question. Then it comes to the, is it new and this, is it creative? I, like I said, it's been already studied 2,000 years and then it's very, very, very difficult, rare to be creative and new. But if it's new and creative, then go for it, uh, go for it. Even though you may not come up with the, the expected result and goals and uh, 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 findings, still, it is worth trying, worth trying. If it's something, if you think it's something new, and if it's original, if it's creative, then go for it. Because <laughs> that's how the 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 knowledge and uh, the academy uh, field has been developed. Someone did something that's considered crazy, and then come up with a enormous contribution to that given field. Then you are to project your purpose and goals. I said prior that expectation, the second one, expectation. If you elaborate more on that expectation, these are like a purpose and goals. So actually you are writing a purpose statement. Purpose, purpose statement should state this research is, and then begin sentence two is to such and such. This is why the statement of why you are doing this research and what is the ultimate, ultimate 
reason for your research. That's a purpose statement. Then under that purpose statement, you, you're going to specify the goals. These are the goals that you want to accomplish or expected findings. Let's say I am studying and doing the research on the leadership of Moses throughout the, uh, the Exodus, the 40 years. So you're focusing on those 40 years out of Egypt and then wilderness into wilderness and 40 years. As you know, Moses did not make cross the Jordan and he wasn't able to go into that promised land but there that 40 years he had led uh, his uh, people as you study Moses their first 40 years then second 40 years and then late 40 years so first meet and late and let's say you're studying that 40 years of Moses' leadership. So you, you kind of narrow down your topic. The purpose of that study is to learn from Moses' leadership during, during the, the long-term crisis, long-term crisis. 40 years is kind of quite a long term. And then crisis begin with out of Egypt until the uh, the entering of Canaan, uh, the, the promised land. So that's kind of uh, to learn from it. And then to learn from it, from it means that you want to apply and apply that to your own context. Because as we, I mean, the Korean church, for example, I'm giving Korean church as an example because that's most familiar with me. As Korean church, whether it's in Korea or whether in, in America, in California, we are going to face these 40 years of wilderness. I'm sure that it's going to happen. And probably we are already into 10 years already, and we have 30, probably 30 more years. So it's kind of wilderness leadership. And only the, 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 the pillar of cloud, the pillar of cloud, and then, then the, the, the pillar of light will lead nothing else. You don't have maps, you don't have, you don't have charted land, you're just going and following as God leads day by day. Same thing. With the Korean church, so you know, knowing the context, probably I'm going to study that Moses leadership in the London crisis and the goals. You can say first goal is to see how Moses related to his people. Second goal to see. How Moses related to God and then three to see how Moses related to outside pressure or threats so those are kind of goals that you can make a statement and write down those goals and specifics and then you you gonna like a choose Exodus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and so on. So those are like a specifics. You, you're writing down the passages and the, the events and so on. <clears throat> so that's how you are going to project your purpose and goals. Once you have, I mean, that's going to take 
most of the time, actually most of the time, uh, and most of the energy. And you have to be, I mean, very careful. And they give your, your priority in doing this. Once you set the, this direction, and the, it's like a, you know, planning for a, a trip. And uh, it's like a planning for a marriage. See, with a good plan, you're going to have a much better execution of that plan. So this planning stage is very important. Then you are going to prepare a research. So once you have a plan, then you need to really cut, sit down and plan and then bring, begin to, you know, work with your hands and feet. So this is where it, set the limitation. This, this is uh, the, another key part of preparation. Actually, now you know the direction that you're going and you are going to into specifics. First, aptitude. You got to know your ability, your capability, your ability. I mean, you, you, you should know yourself. Many times, many researchers that, you know, students I, uh, you know, deal with, they they bring this humongous, uh, uh, you know, project. It's too much. You're writing a, like a 15-page term paper. When you're doing a 15-page term paper, you cannot write down the leadership of Moses during the, the Exodus. I mean, it's not gonna work. The 15-page, no, uh, that's, that's not possible. So, and to study the you know leadership of Moses during the that, uh, the Exodus, you need to have really really good background on the study of leadership, Christian leadership, and probably you have already studied the leadership of Peter, leadership of Jesus, and leadership of Abraham, and so on. You should have if studies unless you have those kind of depth you, you cannot tackle the leadership of Moses during the uh, Exodus so see aptitude how much you already know how much you are uh, prepared and what level of expertise that you have on that the given particular topics is uh, key and important. So you need to evaluate your aptitude. Same with the experience. Uh, many times the experience would be the key to a good research. If you do not have extensive uh, and very intensive experience on a particular topic, of the study, then you probably will not be able to make and reach uh, the, the result that you desire. Then the cost, the time, and, and the energy. Even, I mean, the, any research is going to cost us. It's going to cost your time, it's going to cost your energy and it's going to cost you money. So are you willing to spend certain amount of time and certain amount of energy? When you're writing, for example, 15 page term paper, then there's a certain amount of time that is necessary. Each page may need at least 
five hours for for you know to to have a proper and good term paper. So fifteen page that's fifty hours plus so seventy five, right? At least seventy five hours to do it. And so cost and the time, I mean, included. Then you determine the research method. How you're going to approach it, which research methods that you're going to choose, and then more specific strategies and tactics. Means and method would be very key elements on for the successful uh, research and study. So some of these things are like the considerations and then decide research level and depth. So a good research takes a good planning, good planning. You need to sit down and pray about it and talk to some other colleagues and then your teachers and professors. Those are all the part of preparation to make decisions on these topics. You cannot do your research alone by yourself. It, it doesn't happen that way. That's why we study in, in the school and that's why we have this libraries and then uh, you know at the end i i want you to be a continue i'm a lifetime researcher lifetime researcher you you continue to research and study until the death or your last breath so that's the the the, the spirit of a scholar especially a biblical and pastoral scholar well, thank you for all the attention and uh, listening and uh, your enthusiastic uh, participation in this class. And uh, probably I will see you in uh, some other uh, uh, lectures and topics. Thank you again and God bless.